system. Basically, the gross anatomy, if you have any questions, you can list it in chat. But there's not a whole lot of people here, so let's just get started. Okay, so uh, just a quick outline. We're just going to run through like all the structures of the uh, female reproductive tract, the vagina, the cervix, uterus, fallopian tubes, and ovaries. Then I'll run through the ligaments and supporting structures, the vessels, and then just extra information at the end. Uh, so yeah, let's start with the overview. So for the overview over here, um, when we're looking at the female reproductive tract, we're really just looking at the lower tract over here. So like the vagina, oh, I accidentally moved things. So yeah, so we're looking at the vagina, um, the cervix, and then we're also looking at the uterus. And then finally, we're looking at the fallopian tubes and the ovaries. That's generally the general structure of how things look. And uh, basically, depending on where we are, there are specific functions, there are specific nerves, there are specific arteries that supply these areas. So we're going to be talking about them very quickly. Hopefully it'll be like a quick, nice revision session. So just so we can have a, like a general idea, when you're looking at the uterus, uh, or specifically the female reproductive tract on a lateral or sagittal section, just keep this very simple outline in your head. Just remember that the uterus lies on top of the bladder and then the vagina comes below the uterus with the cervix being in the middle over here. It'll help a ton just to have like a very simple idea on how things are located anatomically in a 3D space. Uh, so I really recommend doing that, like just simplifying concepts to circles and squares. So let's talk about the vagina now. So as far as the vagina is concerned, it's a very strong muscular tube. Um, it's the site where it is the opening for the female reproductive tract. And what do we call it? The most important thing about it, just so we just understand, is these fornices over here. We have the lateral fornices. Oops, I move things around. Let me put draw. Okay. So we have the lateral fornices. Oh, God. Let me just remove that. There we go. There we go. Okay, so we have our lateral fornices over here, and we have anterior and posterior fornices. We'll have a look at them. These are the most important thing about the vagina. There's not a whole lot going on here except the vessels, which we'll talk about at the end. So the most important thing about these is that you can access the peritoneal cavity. So you can reach the peritoneal cavity, or specifically the abdominal cavity, through this uh, through these fornices. Now, the important bit is that you can take fluids, whatever. So... This is generally what you need to know about the vagina when it comes to the female reproductive tract. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here. So yeah, here we can insert needles through the, uh, what do we call it, through the vagina, and then we can access the peritoneal cavity with a needle to aspirate fluid. For example, say someone has bleeding, so there could be blood over here, there could be infection, so it can take pus, etc. Great. So that really concludes the vagina. There's not a whole lot going on there. So let's talk about the cervix next. So the cervix, again, there's not a whole lot going on. The most you need to know about it is just the anatomical orientation of it. So what do we have in the cervix? In the cervix, we're looking at the external os. We're looking, let me pick a better color here. Oops. Yeah, we have the external os. We have the internal os. And then we have the canal itself. Now, obviously, here, the transformation zone happens, the squamic laminar junction. This is more on the histology side of things, so I'm not going to delve too much into it, but just remember it happens here. And infections can happen at this site, so this is really the significance of this site. Um, there's not a whole lot going on here. Again, this is the transition point between the external genitalia to the internal genitalia and the female reproductive tract. Uh, we're going to talk more about this region during the blood supply section. So that's it really for the cervix. So just remember the internal os, external os, and the canal, and the transformation zone being the most important bit about the cervix. So the external part of the cervix over here would be lined by stratified squamous epithelium, while the rest of it will be columnar. So just like the rest of the female reproductive tract. So this is just a view of the cervix. I just wanted to show like an actual picture to like help you visualize it better. Over here, we have the vaginal walls. So oh, like here at the very bottom of the picture and the very top of the picture, followed by like the lateral walls over here. There's this thing sticking out. This is an IUD, which is like a contraceptive. You don't really need to know that, but just for the sake of completion. So this is the cervix within like the like like protruding to the vagina. And then you can access the fornices through like these... Uh, 
the segments over here can go this way, it can go this way, posterior, anterior, and you can access them that way. Now, the most important thing I forgot to mention about the lateral fornices, like these areas, when you go like behind the cervix like this on the lateral sides, is that you can like uh, attempt to palpate the ovaries. So you're going to try to touch the ovaries from these, uh, from these fornices. The reason is the ovaries are very close by and you can attempt to palpate them this way. This is kind of extra information just to help you tie it together. When you like, say you stick a finger in there. So let me just delete again here. So say you stick a finger into the lateral fornices over here. Since the ovary is in close proximity, we can attempt to touch it. Now, usually you can't really touch the ovary unless there's a mass on it. So it's just to tie it with like tumors. So if there's a tumor on the ovary, you can maybe touch the ovary through that way. So that really concludes the cervix. Let's talk about the uterus here real quickly. So the uterus specifically consists of three parts. So we're looking at the, um, uh, let me zoom in for a second. Okay, let me zoom in. Let me take it to the right a little. There we go. All right. So for the uterus, what we're looking at is the body of the uterus, the fundus, and the isthmal portion over here. So these are generally the three components of the uterus. It's consisting of three layers, as you know. It's the endometrium, which is the lining of the uterus. Then there is the myometrium, which is the muscular layer of the uterus, where contractions happen, for example, during labor, um, during the uh, menstrual cycle, etc. That's where contractions usually happen. The uh, endometrial layer is the layer that sheds during the menstrual cycle. And then finally, we have the serosal layer, which is consistent of like connective tissue for arteries to go in. It's It, it can be referred to as the serosal layer or the perimyceum, whatever you prefer to call it. Uh, sorry, the perimetrium, uh, not myceum. So whatever you prefer to call it. Uh, this layer is part of the, uh, if you remember, there's a ligament that covers the, this entire area. We're going to talk about it a bit. It's the broad ligament. So like like this coverage of this area is also formed partially by the broad ligament over here. So that's really the significance of the uterus when it comes to the gross anatomy for it. Um, other than that, the function, obviously, for the uterus is to accept the site. Uh, it's to be the acceptance site for pregnancy. So the structure of the uterus will reflect that function. So the lining of the endometrium will be prepared to receive the implanting embryo, while the myometrium is for expulsion, whether it's uh, during birth or uh, before that in a, say, a miscarriage. And then the uh, endo, oh, sorry, the perimetrium is for blood vessels to supply the uterus. Great. So this brings us to an important concept, which is the position of the uterus. So the uterus is positioned in a way where it is antiverted and anti-flex. So what does anti-flexion mean? So flexion is the angle between the uterus axis, so the body, this line over here, and the yellow line. So if you take a look over here, this is the cervical axis. So this is the cervix over here. Let me delete that again. If you take a look over here, this is the cervix right there, and this is the uterus right here. So the angle between those are, is, is referred to as uh, flexion, while version is between the cervix and the vagina. So the normal position would be anti-flexed, anti-verted, though there are variants where it is found to be retroverted and retroflexed, meaning that the angles, instead of being uh, flex this way, they would be open, like say, uh, that way, right? So this is the cervix, and then there's the vagina down there. So it'll be in that position. So that's really the significance. Just know that the normal position is in most of the population antiverted, anti flexed. However, there are normal variants, this is not pathology, where it could be retroverted and retroflexed in part of the population. So Normally, it's antiverted, uh, antiverted, antiflexed. However, it could be retroverted and retroflexed as well. And there are other variants as well of retroflexion, like partially retroflexed, but like, uh, ret uh, sorry, partially retroverted, but still antiflexed, etc. Just uh, it, the most important thing about this concept is just to you know the, these angles between the uterus, the cervix, and the vagina. Uh, 
like these ones uh what, what are you referring to for normal like this one for example I don't think so. I think the normal variants are this and this. This these could indicate pathology. Maybe something like a tumor or bladder is pushing the the uterus back. Like there's something in the way that's pushing the uterus over here. Whoopsie. So, uh, like as far as I know, this these are the normal variants right here. Like the retroverted, retroflexed, and the antiverted, antiflexed. Okay. All right. So let's talk about the fallopian tubes really quickly. I'm just trying to speed through this portion because it's really easy and want to focus on more of the difficult portions. So as far as the fallopian tube is concerned, we're, it consists of really four portions, but you could consider it as five. So your four portions of the fallopian tube is the interstitial portion over here. This is also known as the intramural portion. The reason it's called intramural is because it's within the wall of the uterus still. So, oh, sorry. It is within the wall of the, yeah, it's within the wall of the uterus. So it's still within the wall. So intramural. There could be the isthmus portion over here, which is the narrowest point of the, uh, uter of the fallopian tube. We have the ampullary region which is the widest area of the fallopian tube. Interestingly, this is where fertilization occurs the most. So like the meeting of sperm and egg occurs in this portion. And uh, what do we call it? The ectopic pregnancies, meaning implantation incorrectly, also occurs most commonly at the ampulla, which makes sense. This is where most fertilizations occur. And then most of the time, ectopic pregnancies will occur over here. Uh, just to tie it, uh, or just to continue from there, we have the infundibulum. So the infundibulum is the beginning portion of the fallopian tube, followed by finally the fimbrae over here. These fimbrae are like finger-like projections because the uterus and, sorry, the fallopian tube and the ovaries are not actually connected. There's a gap over here. Uh, during ovulation, uh, the, an egg is released from the, uh, from the uh, ovary over here which needs to be caught by these fimbrae, which is why they are there. So they're not, it's not like a hollow tube connecting to the ovary directly. No, it, they're not attached together. When ovulation occurs, the fimbrae over here attempt to catch the ovary. No, sorry, attempt to catch the ovum. So as far as this is concerned, I just want to talk about the isthmus portion over here. This is the most significant part. This is what I want you to remember is the ectopic pregnancies that happen over here like if an implantation occurs at this portion, the the fallopian tube is most likely to rupture, meaning it'll break apart, like it'll just bleed. So this is the portion of the fallopian tube that is most risky to have an ectopic pregnancy in. So what happens if uh, the fimbrae doesn't catch the egg? So what happens is the, the egg can go into the cavity so like the, it could be the peritoneal cavity over here and just like swim around and eventually it'll degrade. Though sometimes what happens is it'll eventually degrade. Though what happens sometimes is that a sperm can travel all the way down here, exit the cavity and fertilize the egg outside of the, uh, uh, the fallopian tube. And that causes an ectopic pregnancy that's on the outside of the uterus and the fallopian tube. Now, I'll show you a picture in just a second. So... It'll be something right here. So you see how it says abdominal ectopic pregnancy. This is what happens if the like the egg doesn't just make it through the fallopian tube. And the fimbrae doesn't catch it. Though this is extremely rare. It's like one percent of all ectopic pregnancies, and ectopic pregnancies are generally rare. So uh, did you catch that? All good. Does the embryo survive? Uh, it does for a little bit, but like eventually the reason it survives is because the peritoneum also has uh, like when it's implanting in the peritoneum, there's also blood vessels in the peritoneum, which like kind of invade into the uh, into the ectopic pregnancies. The issue isn't the embryo surviving. It's more like the mother surviving because this will end up with something like it'll rupture like the peritoneum. It can result in like infection eventually, and that can cause the death of the mother. That's the issue. So the embryo is technically surviving, but we really don't want it to survive if you're asking about that. All right, great. All right, next, let's talk about the ovaries. So I'm not going to talk too much about the ovaries. Uh, I just want you to have a look at their structure. 
uh like uh, a let the physiology portion and the histology portion of the uh lectures focus more on like the graphene follicles the different follicles within the ovary itself because uh sometimes what happens is that some of the lectures have differences between them so i just recommend studying them from those portions so just know about the ovaries is that's a sign for eugenesis where like uh ovums are formed and what do we call it? Where sex steroids are formed, like estrogen, progesterone, etc. This is where it forms. And then the ovary over here, the most important thing about it is that it is suspended. There's two ligaments connected to the ovary. We have the ovarian ligament right here. And then we have the pelvic ligament or the suspensory ligament over here. So it's sort of like hanging in the air in the middle. So this is what situates the ovary specifically at this site. So there's two ligaments. The ovarian ligament over here, this is the ovarian. This is the ovarian ligament. And this is the suspensory ligament or the uh, infundibular pelvic. It has two names. So that's really all I want you to know about the ovary. And we'll come back to it when we talk about the ligaments in just a second. Oh, right now. So I just want to focus a little, like more of the discussion on this portion of the uh, uh, of the lecture. Because I think this is the most important bit about the an anatomy. Uh, the other portions are really easy. So let's focus our energy over here. So for the ligaments, we can divide them to ligaments at the cervix level. And we have ligaments at the like uterus level and the pelvic cavity. So let's talk about these ligaments very quickly over here at the level of the cervix. So we have three ligaments here. We have the utrosacral ligament, which is the one over here, this one. This one, the name, why it's called utrosacral, because it connects the uterus to the sacrum. So this, the most important thing about this ligament, this ligament and this ligament, these three ligaments over here that I'm going to discuss, is that they support the female reproductive organs. They provide support in order to prevent prolapse, meaning things falling out of the cavity. So these are generally the, the functions of these ligaments. Just like basically what I want you to know is their names and what they do. So we have the utrosacral ligament, which connects the uterus to the sacrum, which is the bone at the back, the tailbone. We have the pubo, uh, pubocervical ligament, which uh, which connects the cervix to the uh, pub uh, to the pubis bone. And finally, we have the most important ligament out of them, in my opinion, which is the cardinal ligament over here. It's also known as the transverse cervical ligament. It's transverse because it's horizontal. So the cardinal ligament, the most important thing about it is that it contains the uterine arteries and veins. That is really important. So the uterine arteries and veins run in this ligament to supply the uterus itself. So it also provides like a, it has a sub, it has a secondary function to support the uterus to prevent it from prolapsing. But the most important thing about this ligament is that it contains these arteries and veins. The, the way this connects is that it connects to the cervix over here. So this is the cervix. And then it connects to the lateral pelvic wall. So there's like bone over here of the lateral pelvic wall. It connects there and it comes in uh, through that way. So those are the ligaments at the level of the cervix. They're very simple. They're just three ligaments that support the pelvic floor over here. What's the, the, the rest of the ligaments are actually very important. And uh, I'd focus my discussion over here. So we have uh, four ligaments that we really need to focus on in terms of the female reproductive tract, specifically in the pelvic region. So we have the broad ligament, which is the most important one out of them all. It basically is a very big ligament. That's why it's called broad. It runs all the way from here till here. And it contains literally every structure in the female reproductive, the internal female reproductive tract. It's divided into three portions, uh, like uh, theoretically. So we have the mesosalpinx, which is this region over here. This is the mesosalpinx. Basically, it's the region between the inferior border of the fallopian tube all the way down to the ovary. So this is called the mesosalpinx. We have the mesometrium. Uh, let me just delete this so it's a little clearer. Oops. Let me just get it. There we go. We have the mesometrium, which runs from over here. Uh, just let me confirm. No, it runs all the way. Uh, I apologize. I misread the diagram. So it runs all the way up here above the ovary. So if you take a look over here, it's right next to the ovaries. That's why it's called the meso-ovarium. 
the mesometrium is the portion over here because it runs in close correlation with the endometrium and the what do we call it? And the uterus. So the way you divide them is in three ways. So we have the one that's in close relation to the fallopian tube. We have the one that's in close relation to the ovary, and we have the one that's in close relation to the uterus. So th these are the three portions of the broad ligament, and it contains a, a whole lot of things. We'll discuss them in the next slide. The next ligament is the round ligament. The round ligament connects the horns of the uh, uterus, which are the like the sort of the tips on the lateral side of the uterus, all the way through the inguinal canal, if you remember that, to the labia majora. So if you know the male reproductive system, what runs in the inguinal canal is the spermatic cord, if you remember that. What runs in the inguinal canal in the female reproductive system is the round ligament. This is a supporting ligament. There's not a whole lot of function here except that it basically supports the uterus and its position. We have the infundibulopelvic ligament or the uh, suspensory ligament that has another name, so suspensory. This is a very important ligament because it also contains vessels. So the, the ligaments that contain vessels are very important to remember. So this one contains a uh, ovarian artery and a vein. So this is where the ovarian artery and vein run in to supply the ovaries themselves. Finally, we have the actual ovarian ligament, which is, let me delete all this mess over here. There we go. Uh, let's make the handwriting a little smaller. There we go. So we have the um, the ovarian ligament itself. So uh, the ovarian ligament runs from the lateral portion of the uterus over here all the way down to the ovary over here. So the only function of this ligament is just to support the ovary and fix it in place. It's not very important. Just remember that this ligament suspends the ovary over here. So like they use, generally when it comes in questions, they use this ligament to confuse you where the ovarian vessels run. They do not run in the ovarian ligament. They run in the infundibulopelvic ligament. Great. So the broad ligament itself if you take a look over here, it's not like just this sheath that's covering the top. It covers both sides. The reason it covers both sides over here is because it's like an extension of some of the fascia from like the abdominal wall that comes all the way down to the that comes all the way down to the uterus. So that's why it covers both sides. The most important thing about it is that it contains literally everything that within the internal genital tract of uh, females. And uh, what do we call it? It's a supporting ligament. Basically, it has blood vessels. It runs everything that uh, that needs blood supply within this region because vessels can't just run on their own free like this. They need to be within a ligament. So this ligament facilitates this blood supply to this region and also supports the uterus by preventing prolapse. So what what is contained within the uh, broad ligament are the fallopian tubes. So both fallopian tubes are within the broad ligament. We have the round ligament of the uterus, which comes in this way and then curves around. Oh, it's right there. So we also have our uterine vessels and ovarian vessels that run here. We have the uh, plexuses for, uh, what do we call it? For nerves. We have our uh, remnants from our uh, like uh, embryological life. So we have the upofuron, which is the homolog to the epididymis. It's within, and it's duct, the Gartner's duct. You really need to know this. It's just for listing, really. If this comes up in like an SAQ, you can list these things. So these are just sort of remnants of structures that are found within the broad ligament. Finally, we have our lymph nodes and vessels. So the way it, so the way I would divide it is that there are vessels, uh, nerves, lymphatics, and then other ligaments and structures like the fallopian tube, the uterus, etc., that run within the uh, the broad ligament itself. This is just a superior view of what's going on. So this is sort of we're looking from the side where we're we're taking a look from the side of the uterus. I just want you to visualize how it looks like from the top. So this is the anterior portion over here. This is the posterior portion. Let me move this out of the way. So this is the posterior portion down there. Uh, we have our rectum over here. We have our pouch of Douglas over here. If you remember that, it's the utero uh, rectal pouch. So it runs over here. 
We have our vesico uh, vesico uterine pouch right in front of the uterus. And then finally, the more important thing is how the ligaments run. If you take a look at the broad ligament, look look at how it covers everything like a curtain. So it runs all the way across the entire pelvic floor uh, to cover the uterus, to cover the fallopian tubes, to cover every ligament and structure that is found within the pelvic cavity. So it just covers, the, it's both sides. Uh, it covers both sides of the picture over here. It's just cut out for uh, visualization. So uh, if you take a look over here, we have the mesometria, mesovarium, the mesosalpinx, a round ligament going anteriorly. So this round ligament will go all the way anteriorly, join the inguinal canal, eventually end up in the uh, labia majora connecting there. So uh, just it runs this way. Other than that, we have our other ligaments over here. We have our ovarian ligament running over here. We have the suspensory ligament. Notice how the suspensory ligament contains the ovarian vessels. That's the most important thing about it. And uh, really, that's it about this specific diagram. So I added a table from AMBOSS just so you can have a look at the ligaments and what they do. This this really summarizes what they do. I think uh, it, it's a little extra information about some things, but it really covers the entire thing that I just spoke about. So now we just want to really briefly talk about structures that support the uterus and prevent it from prolapsing. So there are structures like a series of structures that support the uterus to make sure it doesn't just fall out of the pelvic cavity and specifically other structures as well. So it's not only the uterus that can prolapse. It's also like the rectum, the bladder, et cetera. Anything found within the pelvic cavity can prolapse. So these structures make sure it doesn't happen. So the most important ones are your muscles and ligaments. So your muscles, you have the pelvic floor muscles, which I have a diagram for right after this. We have the urogenital floor muscles and the perineal body. Um, you can cover those during, uh, I think there's another anatomy lecture that covers the pelvic floor. So you can have a look at them in more detail there. Our ligaments that are very important for preventing prolapse are the cardinal ligament, the pubocervical ligament, the utrosacral ligament, and the round ligament. So you remember those cervical ligaments I first talked about. So you have a cervix over here, then you have ligaments connecting anteriorly like this. We have the a ligament connecting this way, and then we have a ligament connecting posteriorly. So this would be the uh, utrosacral, this would be the cardinal, and this one would be the uh, uh, pubocervical. So these ligaments are the generally the main support of the pelvic floor alongside these muscles over here. So I would remember these two. There are other structures that support the uterus that prevent it from prolapsing. We have the bladder because it's in the way of the uterus, especially when it's in the antiverted, anti-flex position. And we have the vagina itself supporting the uterus from the bottom. There are other ligaments that help support the uh, pelvic floor or the pelvic cavity from prolapsing. Those are like the broad ligament because the broad ligament connects to like the peritoneum and everything there. So it pulls everything upwards. Uh, that's why it provides support, though it is minimal. We have like folds of the peritoneum. We have other like different folds of the peritoneum. These are just pure memorization. So just don't spend too much time looking into what they do specifically. So just to like visualize it, we have pelvic floor muscles over here. We have the levator ani, bulbal spongiosis. We have uh, different uh, deep transverse perineal muscles. So we have the uh, the perineal body over here that supports. We have the pelvic floor muscle that support. And we also have ligaments. So this is another view from the bottom. You can see how these muscles form part of the pelvic floor to help support and prevent prolapse of the uterus. And these are the ligaments we talked about earlier over here. So the idea is just to prevent the slipping of the uterus to the outside. It, it has degrees. Uh, it is listed over here. I do not think you need to know this because uh, this is a little bit advanced. But just in case, if it is partially... Uh, it, it, no, I don't think you need to know this because this is like year four stuff. So uh, I would just remember that the uterus can prolapse due to weakness of one of these structures, like either the ligaments themselves the muscles, or say an abnormal position of the uterus. Finally, we have the vasculature and nerves. I think this is the most important part of the lecture. So this is honestly just pure memorization, just so you can uh, remember it. Uh, 
So we have the pelvic cavity. I'll try to make it easier. There is the, the main supply of the pelvic cavity is the internal iliac artery. So it's this artery over here, the internal iliac. This is the main important thing that runs within the pelvic cavity. Now, this provides about eight branches. These branches are like the superior vesicle. Let me make this a little smaller so I can type a little better. I'll write a little better. There we go. And we have our superior vesicle, inferior vesicle, the vaginal, the uterine, inferior gluteal, etc. So all these arteries are branches of the internal iliac over here. Uh, as far as how you might get asked about it in an exam, they might ask you in an SAQ to list some of the branches of this artery. So maybe memorize like five or six of these. But j just to make it easy, these branches generally just remember the structures within the pelvic cavity. So we have a bladder, right? So the bladder is supplied by vesicle arteries. These vesicle arteries are like the superior vesicle, the inferior vesicle. So that's how I'd remember that. We have the uterus. So we, there's a uterine artery that comes there, the vaginal artery, the inferior gluteal, the middle rectal, the obturator, the internal pedonodal. Honestly, this is just pure memorization. Uh, you just need to sit down and memorize these arteries, maybe look at their branches and try to associate and correlate what's going on here. These come from the division of the anterior trunk. I think these are the most important because uh, these are the supply for the internal genitalia of the uterus. If, like over here, this portion over here, the anterior trunk. This is anterior over here. Just for the sake of completion, this is posterior over here. So the posterior trunk will supply other structures in the posterior pelvic cavity. So it's more like superficial blood supply to like the butt area, superior gluteal region, the lateral sacral, which is like for the sacrum, et cetera. And then the iliolumbar. This is just pure memorization. Just remember there's an anterior trunk, posterior trunk, and this has eight arteries total. This has three arteries. Uh, memorize specifically a couple of these, about like five or six of these, most importantly, the uterine, vaginal, etc. And there are also arteries that supply the posterior uh, portion of the pelvic cavity. So this is just another diagram to help you visualize that we have our internal iliac, which splits into an anterior division over here and a posterior division back there. Now you could memorize the arteries based on the position they come out from. So uh, depending on where they come out from, for example, superior vesicle would be on the superior portion, inferior vesicle would be on the inferior portion, inferior gluteal, etc. So just have a stare at the diagrams. You can just cover them up and uh, you should be good to go there. As far as the blood supply, this is actually more important than the pelvic cavity arteries. I don't know why that was included in the lecture. So we can focus more on this. Uh, the vagina is supplied by the vaginal artery, a vaginal branch in the uterine artery, the middle rectal, and the internal pedonodal. So let's take a look over here. So this is the vagina right here, this portion at the bottom. It receives its own blood supply through a vaginal artery. Though if you take a look over here, there are uterine arteries coming in this way that do go all the way down in anastomose. These arteries down here will also contribute to the blood supply of the vagina, but that's not enough to cover the entire vagina. Because if you remember the vagina over here, we have a, if we have our vagina right here as a tube right here, we have this upper portion, which is supplied by the uh, vaginal arteries and the uh, uterine arteries. However, there's this bottom portion over here next to the, uh, like the entrance of the vagina. It needs to be supplied by other arteries. So we have our middle rectal artery and the internal pedonodal, which supply this lower segment of the vagina because the upper segment is covered by these two arteries while the lower segments are not. So you need other arteries to help contribute to the blood supply of the vagina. The rest of the uh, female reproductive tract is really easy to remember their blood supply. So we have our ovarian arteries and the uterine arteries, which are a supply of the uterus. So the uterine artery makes sense because it is the uterine artery. It's after its name. It comes through the transverse. If you remember the cardinal ligament over here comes all the way there and supplies the entire ure uterus over here. However, if you take a look over here, there's this ovarian artery coming in and it's supplying the ovary over here and it's continuing all the way down to this portion of the uterus, sort of the top lateral area. This area over here is also supplied by the ovarian artery. So the uterus does receive dual blood supply by the uterine arteries and the ovarian arteries. Uh, but the most significant contribution would be the, uh, 
the uterine artery in this case. Finally, we have our fallopian tube. Our fallopian tube, very similar idea. Uh, ovarian arteries will supply it, and then also uterine arteries will climb up and supply the fallopian tube. The lateral portions of the fallopian tube, so the sort of this outer third of the fallopian tube, if you make a cutoff over here, you make a cutoff over here, this is supplied by the ovarian, while the rest of it is supplied by the uterine. And finally, the ovaries themselves are only supplied by the ovarian arteries, which makes sense. So honestly, just memorize this or just try to understand it this way to make it make sense. And uh, really, that's it. It's very simple over here. Next, we have our venous drainage. Our venous drainage looks almost identical to the um, to the blood supply. So the way it works is that we have our, let's start with the vagina again. There's this plexus that forms. So it's sort of this network of veins that forms on top of the vagina over here. This eventually culminates into one vein known as the vaginal vein. It becomes the vaginal vein. And that eventually drains into the interior, internal iliac uh, vein. So it's the same pathway as the blood supply, except that it's only by one vein. It's not like the vagina where it's supplied by four arteries over here. It's supplied, it's only drained by one vein. The uterus is also drained by one vein, the same idea. So we have a uterine plexus over here that forms sort of this network of vessels everywhere like this. Eventually that all culminates into this one vessel known as the uterine vein. And eventually that uh, that joins with the internal iliac over here to become the internal iliac vein. So it's a very straightforward pathway. So the uterus has its uterine artery, the um, uh, the vagina has its vaginal vein, sorry, vein, the vaginal vein. And obviously the ovaries will have their ovarian veins over here. But before we jump into that, let's talk about the fallopian tubes. The fallopian tubes, like the blood supply, very similar. It drains either through the ovarian veins or the uterine veins. So depending on the location, whether it's in the outer third or not, uh, it can either drain in, uh, through the venous drainage system of the uterus, or it can drain through the venous drainage system of the ovaries over here. Oh, whoops, let me pick this. There we go. Let me delete all of that. Great. There we go. Finally, we have our ovaries, which drain through the pampaniform plexus. It's the same plexus from the testicles. It follows the same idea. It drains through the ovarian vein into the inferior vena cava directly. It doesn't go to the internal iliac. Um, if you remember, on the right side, it drains directly into the IVC, while on the left side, so the left ovarian uh, vein will drain into the renal vein, and then eventually that'll join the uh, that'll join the uh, inferior vena cava. So just a really small nuance regarding the venous drainage of both the uh, testes and the ovaries, just to link them here together. Other than that, the venous drainage is very straightforward, very similar to the uh, bl blood supply of the uterus and the vagina. Lymphatic drainage is pretty straightforward too. So I want to divide the uterus here into two portions. We have our upper portion of the uterus, so sort of this region, and we have the lower portion of the uterus, sort of this region down there. So the upper portion, meaning the fundus and the upper uterus, will drain by lymph nodes called the paraaortic lymph nodes. So these lymph nodes are, well, from their name, paraaortic, meaning next to the aorta. So this is the drainage pathway of the majority of the top of the uterus and the fundus. Except there's a small little branch over here to the superficial inguinal. It's not really significant. Sort of on this lateral portion of the uterus over here that drains into the uh, superficial inguinal lymph nodes, which goes down here, like it goes all the way down here and drains there. So this is not important. What's important to remember here is the paraaortic lymph nodes are the drainage of the superior uterus. Next, we have our lower uterus. So our superior uterus is by the paraaortic over here. Our lower uterus is, trained, is drained by the external iliac lymph nodes. So sort of over here. 
If you take a look over here, this lower portion is drained directly into the external iliac lymph nodes. Pretty straightforward. Finally, we have our cervical region. So the cervix, um, it has different lymph nodes depending on which position we are looking at it. So it kind of follows the same pattern where the more lateral the structure is, it drains to the closer lymph node. So if you take a look, so the lateral uterus, would, uh, sorry, the lateral cervix will be over here. So this is the lateral portion. It's closer to the external iliac, so it'll drain this way. Posterior lateral mean we curve inwards a little bit. So let me delete that arrow. Posterior lateral will curve a little bit inwards like this. It'll go posteriorly and laterally. So that'll drain a little more closer to these, which are the internal iliacs, the lymph nodes of the internal iliac. And then finally, we have, if you go all the way posteriorly to the back, it'll just drain directly into the sacral lymph node. So sort of the tailbone region, which makes sense again. So it goes all the way back. So this this is not up. This is behind. So just so uh, we're clear, but like the diagram is two dimensional. So depending on the position, it drains that way. This is what, what's the importance of this? Like, what the lymphatic drainage is literally just for the spread of tumors and cancers. Just so you know where they like where you can predict they can spread depending on the position of the tumor. So if a tumor, if a question gives you a tumor that's on the fundus. They'll ask you, hey, it started to spread, metastasize. What's the most likely site? Your answer would be, yo, it'll spread to the paraaortic lymph nodes. So the same idea applies to the other portions of the lymphatic drainage. Finally, we have our nerve supply. Our nerve supply, Dr. Atav divides it into like somatic and autonomic. All these nerves, starting from the obturator, all the way down to the infernal, uh, sorry, infernal, inferior gluteal nerve are not involved in the uh, blood, oh, sorry, the nerve supply of any structure of the internal uh, uh, female reproductive tract. These are just nerves that are just passed by through this cavity. So we have our like uh, sciatic nerve over here, which is formed by L4, L5, S1, S2, S3, uh, ventral rami, which you will cover later. These nerves, you will cover them within MSK. So I'm not going to delve too much into what they do or where they're derived from. Just know that they're there and they run within this cavity. We have our obturator nerve. We have our sciatic nerve, superior gluteal, inferior gluteal. These are all nerves that have function of moving the lower limb. So they just move the lower limb. Like they make it flex, extend, etc. So we're not going to focus the discussion here. We're going to focus more on the internal pudendal nerve. So this internal pudendal nerve is formed by S2, S3, and S4. So this is just for memorization. Again, I would memorize these nerve roots over here. They may ask you about it directly. So this is just pure memorization in a sense. But I would focus more on the internal pudendal nerve, this one over here, because it is the main supply of the perineal region, the genital region, that region that we're really dealing with at the moment, because it gives off your inferior rectal nerve, which goes to the rectum, obviously. We have the perineal nerve over here, posterior labial, the dorsal nerve of the clitoris, which is for sexual uh functions, etc. So this is the nerve that's most important in this sense. So I would just memorize this nerve. As far, like the more importantly is the autonomic nerves of this region. We have sympathetics and parasympathetics. So the way this works is that there's a sympathetic chain that runs right next to the, let me change a better color here. So there's a sympathetic chain that runs right next to the vertebra over here. So sort of over here, all the way next to the vertebra, et cetera. These give off nerves and plexuses. You really just need to memorize their names. You don't really need to know much over here. It's kind of complicated. But know that the sympathetic chain has vessels all over the uterus and the vagina, et cetera, that eventually come together in a plexus known as the hypogastric plexus. And those carry afferent fibers, meaning like sort of sensory isk fibers that go to the sympathetic chain and then carry information that way. So they go all the way up to the sympathetic chain, carry information that way. As far as the parasympathetic 
supply is concerned, it's it, it, it's a little different because it doesn't follow the sympathetic chain pathway. It follows splank. Uh, I, I wrote veins over here. I meant nerves. So it follows uh, the afferent splanchnic nerves. Basically, this nerve is the same derivative as the internal pudendal nerve, but it just carries some parasympathetic fibers. So same idea. We have a bunch of parasympathetic fibers over here, plexusing on top of the uterus, on top of the, the vagina and the cervix over here. They all culminate into nerves, which are known as the pelvic splanchnic nerves, which then enter the spinal cord and deliver their uh, parasympathetic uh, information that way. Now, what's the importance of this? What, what, what's super important about this? The uterus, just like any other organ within the uh, intra-abdominal cavity, so like the stomach, esophagus, uh, bladder, etc., they don't have somatic nerves, meaning they don't have sensation in the same way your hands have sensation. So what's important is that pain in this region is referred meaning you have a vague type of pain that refers to this region in a different way than what you would expect. So these nerves over here, these parasympathetic and sympathetic nerves will carry fibers that'll have, uh, they'll carry sort of these fibers, which are the sympathetic fibers and the parasympathetic fibers from the uterus. So say there's a problem, let's explain it in a better way. So say there's a problem in the uterus over here, right? So there's pregnancy happening over here and this uterus is being stretched out and there's something painful happening over here, right? In this uterine region. What happens is, is that these sympathetic nerves will carry this impulse, though it's not pain. It's not a painful impulse. It'll go all the way to the spinal cord. This spinal cord can't really interpret this area as pain directly. So what happens is, is that there's somatic fibers, meaning normal nerves, say the internal pedonidal nerve. So there's an internal pedonidal nerve. It'll, what happens is that these sympathetic fibers will sort of stimulate this other nerve and it'll form a referred pain, meaning it'll feel pain over this region down here, sort of this abdominal region, this pelvic region. So you'll feel a vague pain over this stomach region, over this perineal region, even though it's coming from the inside. So you don't feel the pain directly from the inside. The pain fibers hitchhike all the way from the uterus to these normal nerves, and then they will refer the pain that way. So that's really the most important bit about this sympathetic, parasympathetic nonsense that's going on over here. So just remember that the referred pain occurs secondary to them. So labor areas are remember the sympathetic nerves, the parasympathetic nerves, the pudendal nerve. These were areas of pain that will be referred. Uh, finally, we have some miscellaneous information, additional information about like nerve blocks, etc. So Dr. Atov delved into like pudendal nerve block, uh, epidural nerve block, uh, spinal nerve block. Really, all you need to know is that remember that referred pain we talked about like earlier over here we need to suppress it because it's really painful during labor or delivery of the baby so we have options over here we have pudendal nerve block so we can insert a needle through we can go through the vagina all the way behind the ischial spine that's the most important thing where the pudendal nerve will be running it's just posterior to this uh spine and we can inject a nerve block over here to prevent pain now, the only problem with this type of uh, nerve block, it's not used anymore in clinic. And they don't use this anymore when in, during child delivery. The issue with it is that there are other nerves over here. So there's a nerve here called the ilioinguinal nerve. This can carry pain fibers from labor pain. So those sympathetic fibers I talked about can come into this nerve and cause pain over this region. And obviously, if you only block the internal pudendal nerve, you won't cover the area that is supplied by the ilioinguinal nerve, and that'll cause severe pain over this region. So what we opt for usually is either spinal injections or epidurals. Uh, you don't really need to know the difference. Just know that you can give like a caudal epidural injection. You can just shove it into the uh, K2 
canal over here, the spinal canal, inject the uh, the anesthetic and that will numb the region of the perineal area. Or we can just directly inject it into the spinal cord itself. So that's really the only difference between these two. You don't really need to know any of that. Just know that the nerve block, the problem with pedonidal nerve block is that it does not cover the areas that are supplied by other nerves during this region. Finally, the last thing is the episiotomy. So this procedure is known as an episiotomy. Okay, so during birth, so this is the vagina over here, the introitus, we're looking at the head of the baby. Some babies have bigger heads, so they have something like a really big head, maybe due to something genetic or something metabolic, and they can't really fit through the vaginal introitus or the entrance of the vagina. So what we could do is we can do an epi uh, episiotomy, which basically means we cut through the perineum over here or over here to make the hole a little bigger for the baby to pass. That's the idea. The only difference, so that we can do it through two procedures. We can either do it through a midline incision. Basically, we cut midline all the way to the anus. This is the anus over here. Not all the way, but just partially towards the anus. Or we could do a uh, medial lateral. So we can start over here in the middle, and then we cut laterally this way. The reason we uh, do the lateral incision is that we need to avoid hitting the sphincter. So there's a muscle over here, the anal sphincter, that runs all the way around here. It's in really close proximity. So if you cut this way, you can cut this, and that will result in something known as fecal incontinence, meaning they can't hold fecal matter anymore. And there'll be constant dribbling of fecal matter that'll happen, which we really don't want that. So alternatively, what you could do, however, this is very effective. Alternatively, what we could do is we can cut laterally this way to avoid hitting the sphincter that's over here. And that will help facilitate the delivery that way. So the idea is we're cutting uh, the perineal membrane. So there's a perineal membrane over here. We're cutting it. And there's a deep transverse perineal muscle that runs this way. So we're cutting those to help facilitate the delivery of the baby. Though I do want to point out that this procedure is no longer really used anymore because it, it doesn't really benefit uh it doesn't really benefit the delivery, though this is a little like extra information. But just remember that the cut here is midline, the cut here is lateral. But this is no longer employed in general. It's really it's not really an ideal procedure because you're you're risking cutting the anus over here, and the, it's not a good time. It's not recovered once like incontinence happens. It's kind of permanent. Now, just a really quick question about the ligaments. So suppose that you want to remove the uterus, right? And there, because there's a tumor in a 60-year-old patient, you just want to remove the uterus. And you need to ligate the artery that supplies the vast majority of the uterus. This artery is contained within which of the following ligaments? So we're talking about the uterine artery over here. The uterine artery. You just need to know where the uterine artery runs. So it does not run in the ovarian ligament. It doesn't run in the utrosacral ligament. And it does not run in the suspensory ligament. Uh, it runs in the cardinal ligament. So it is not C. The reason it's not C is because the, the ovarian vessels run in the suspensory ligament. This is ovarian. You're not removing the ovaries. You're removing the uterus itself. Yep. So the cardinal ligaments contain the uterine arteries. This could be how like one question could ask you about the ligaments. But honestly, it's pretty straightforward. Really? Um, uh, that concludes the lecture. I just added a small little, uh, a small little diagram over here. Oh, sorry, a small little laparoscopic image of the uterus. So it can just help you visualize it a little better. So, um, let me just, uh, delete this portion over here. I accidentally drew it. Okay. So just so we're like looking at the uterus. So we're looking through a camera into the cavity, the pelvic cavity, we're looking at the uterus over here. We're looking at the ovaries down here. Take a look there, this white structure down there over here. We have our fallopian tubes running this way. We have a round ligament that's curving around the other way. So 
And over here would be the rectum, if you take a look over here, back, way back here. And this would be the pouch of Douglas down here. So I left a key over here. Uh, you can see it in the notes down there if you want to read it. Uh, this is the fallopian tube, ovaries, etc. This is this is the real image to help you tie it all together. Other than that, that really concludes the session. It's a pretty straightforward lecture. It's really easy. Just needs a revision a couple times. Just remember the blood supply, the nerve supply of the uterus. Remember the referred pain stuff. And just remember the ligaments in general. I think that's the most important portion of this lecture. Other than that... Uh, feel free to scan the QR code and uh, give feedback for the session. Other than that, I conclude uh, here. Thank you so much.